How's it going, all you minties? Uncanny Omar here from Near Mint Condition, the home of Collected Editions. And join me today for your advanced look at the Murky World by Richard Corbin Hardcover from Dark Horse Comics. So, let's take a look at this together. And welcome back, everybody. Before going any further, I do want to thank the kind folks at Dark Horse Comics for sending us an advanced copy of this hardcover. This hardcover is due out in the direct market on May 3rd and the book market on May 16th. And it is the beginning of the Richard Corbin collection in hardcover format. They have other works which I'm really excited for, like Den. Oh my gosh, I can't wait to see that. But this is the very first book and it also happens to be i believe the last book or the last series of comics that he worked on before he passed away because we lost richard in 2020. so what we're looking at here is the cover and to kind of give you an idea of the dimensions of this book here it is compared to the size of an omnibus so it looks to be about the same height let's actually take a look at the spines together Matter of fact, it's just a slightly bit, and I mean a slightly bit taller than this omnibus right here. But one thing you can probably tell is that it's definitely longer than this omnibus. So, to kind of give you an idea of how much longer, that much longer, than this omnibus right here. So let's shift the focus back to this. So, it does have a dust jacket. We'll look at underneath the dust jacket here in a little bit. But you have the title Murky World right there, Richard Corbin, and I'm not sure if you can tell, but the frame around this picture right here, it's so unfair to call it a picture. It's like a freaking painting. They're beautiful. And you'll see here in a little bit. And the word, his name, Richard Corbin, all have a foil stamp on it. So it's like this bronze foil stamp they're using there. And on the spine, they're using it for his name. I'm not sure if you can tell with the reflection but right there and murky world the other thing i want to bring attention to is not only does it say dark horse down there but also his own label fantor press which i think lasted from 1986 to about the mid 90s when unfortunately the comic book market was just imploding and let's look at it underneath the dust jacket you get more of that beautiful image and here's what the flaps look like. There's nothing there. The book retails for $39.99. And there's also the Fantor Press logo right there. And then Dark Horse. Love it. So for the first time ever, we are getting his stuff collected in hardcover format in America. Even though he was an American creator, a lot of his stuff has been published overseas and in South America. I've had some of my South American viewers actually show me some of these hardcovers that they have. And I was so jealous. But now we're getting it for the first time here in America. So here it is. All without the text. So you can get a better idea of what it looks like. Richard Corbin. It isn't foiled though. It doesn't have that bronze foil stamp on it. And then murky world we're going to talk a little bit about it by giving you the premise but i swear even giving you the premise it's not going to do this book justice because it's less of a story and more of an experience yes it's that type of book so if it's your first time ever hearing the name richard corbin oh my gosh i hope i do this video justice because that band's artwork so phenomenal and i'll tell you a little bit of history about him and where you may have seen his art because some people don't even realize that they may have seen his art somewhere out there but let's go ahead and look at this gorgeous book oh and one more thing uh, it does have a flat spine just like all the other dark horse books now let's go ahead and crack it open now before i crack this open i do have to state that this is for mature audiences doesn't tell you on the back, but this has a lot of violence and it has nudity and some sexual content. Nothing that you haven't seen in the pages of something like Blade of the Immortal, Berserk, if you're a fan of those stories, or anything from the In Incal or European comics. But I do want to state that it is for mature audiences. And yes, speaking of Incal, this freaking feels and reads like a European comic. Oh my gosh, look at that landscape. 
So, murky world. Now, something you may not have noticed is that on the back of the dust jacket, and I didn't point this out, there are praises for the work of Richard Corbin by Mobius, who also we lost, and Alan Moore. And the praises are just amazing. We have an introduction from Mike Mignola, who actually got to work with Richard Corbin. But first, let's look at the credits here. Richard Corbin, Art and Letters, Story and Script from pages 1 through 96, and then Story Collaboration, because he collaborated with Mike Shields on the last part of Murky World, and then the scripts from pages 97 to 108, and then 109 to 120 were scripted by Mike Shields. Richard Corbin and Beth Corbin Reed, his widow, uh, doing the colors, and then Murky World one-shot, Art and Script, and then the letters by Clem Robbins. That one is done in black and white, and it almost feels like a precursor to this. I have never read this stuff before, uh, so just be forewarned, this was my first time reading it. Here's a beautiful introduction from Mike Mignola talking about the man who was Richard Corbin and how mysterious he was. He was 80 years old when we lost him, and just how big of a fan he was of him and how wonderful it felt to collaborate with Richard Corbin and that Hellboy story. And he wanted to keep working with him, but Richard Corbin came from the world of indie comics, so he wanted to do his own thing, and he did. So yes, he first got his start in Heavy Metal Magazine. That's As a matter of fact, that is the very first work I ever uh, saw from him was from the movie. It was the adaptation of his Den comic. I had no idea what it was. All I knew was like it was cartoons for adults. And that was before I found out about the magazine. So I started just uh, collecting the magazines and I wasn't allowed to have them. So I hid them underneath my bed, sometimes underneath my cushion at times because there were, you know, some nudity and a lot of violence in there. But oh my gosh, that's the first time I ever saw Mobius. All those type of artists I found through Heavy Metal Magazine. And that's the first time I had seen his artwork was in the adaptation of Den. However, I didn't realize that he was also the artist for the Bad Out of Hell, Meatloaf, Bad Out of Hell. The, the, the album cover was Richard Corbin. Holy crap, I must have stared at that thing for so many days, so many nights just looking at that cover. I loved it. I had no idea it was him. But maybe some of you are familiar, so that's one that I'm, maybe some of you are familiar of the name Richard Corbin, or there's maybe some of you from his work at Marvel and DC later on. He did a run with Brian Azzarello on Hellblazer, and he also did, actually he, he went on to do the Bruce Banner story, I think it was just called Banner if I'm not mistaken, or Starling Stories Banner, uh, he did the Luke Cage story for the Max imprint, but one of my favorite ones, and a lot of people's favorite work that he did, was the Punisher, the end with Garth Ennis, he did a Ghost Rider story, and again, he did some things with, I think he did some independent stuff with like Rob Zombie later on that was published by IDW, if I'm not mistaken. He did some of the stories in the Conan of Samaria and those can be found in trade paperback formats. And then of course, the story with uh, Mike Mignola on Hellboy. But then he wanted to come back to this. So I think he was doing this at the age of 75, 76. If I'm not mistaken, because this is the last thing he did. All right, so let's talk about Murky World, because this this feels like a freaking dream sequence. We have this character of Tugat right here. I'm sorry, he's right here. He's laying down, and he's waking up from what seems to be a dream. This, by the way, you should be falling in love with the textures, the shadows. Oh my gosh, I'll, I'll get to that in here in a little bit. So he's waking up from this dream by this old woman. And he set out on a mission. He's going to go and see what happened to his master, the, the person that trained him. Now, along his way of trying to find his master, he runs across a slave girl. Now, it feels like a dream sequence because he goes from being an old bald man to a younger man without a beard and a, just a full head of hair right there. It doesn't explain why or how or if it's magic. It's kind of left up to you, or if this is all a dream. And he ring, uh, he runs into this character right here named Moha, who is an escaped slave. And she wants to escape all these people that are putting her and her people 
under slavery, and he's like, no, I gotta go and find out what happened to my master, Obex. So he goes and tries to find out what happened to Obex, and unfortunately, he ended up getting some bad news about Obex. Now, the rest of the story features just weird creatures like Cyclops and uh, shape-shifting uh, creatures. There's a Colosseum fight right here. And it doesn't go the way that I expected it to go. As a matter of fact, it goes into some weird territory. Because I think when you read enough comics or enough stories or you watch enough movies or TV shows, there's certainly a pattern when it comes to the hero, this barbarian type of hero. And yes, it is very in your face about it probably borrowing elements from Robert E. Howard, uh, Conan. But, you know, you, you have this muscular hero and you have this damsel in distress, an escaped slave. And it doesn't go the way that you expect it to go. You expect him to go in there and fight in this coliseum and rescue all of the slaves. And it doesn't go in that route at all. And you can find out exactly what ends up happening here. Uh, and then we see him age again. We see him turn into an old man, going from old to young again. And a lot of things just keep changing around him. But my gosh, this feels less like a comic book and more like walking into an experience and just being thrown in the middle of this story and expected to be caught up there is a certain beauty about that right like there, there's certainly something to be said about that that you're just thrown in the middle of a story you don't need to know anything beforehand you don't know any of the histories between these characters and you're learning about this world through these characters but then there's also a sense of confusion because it feels like well, I kind of want to know more. I want to know the background of all these characters. I want to know the background of this world. Is this our world? Or is this a world that is completely made up? Yeah, there was a lot of butt nudity during those scenes. But here we go. Let's look at some of these pages here. The zombies. So it almost feels like going back to that Meatloaf Bad Out of Hell album. It freaking feels like a heavy metal song. That's what it feels like. You're just thrown in the middle of this madness and you're expected to be caught up. Hell yes. Sometimes you need that when it comes to reading or experiencing this type of medium. Now, what's really cool about this is that you also get the original murky world that was presented in the Dark Horse Presents issues one through three. This story feels kind of like a prototype to the main story, the colored story that was finished. Because in here... We see the character of Tugat again, and he's looking for his horse this time around, the horse named Frix. So he's going around this particular world and just meeting all these strange creatures and all these strange characters. You don't know who to trust, but again, it feels like a dream sequence. And then we get the back matter here. I love this stuff. This is the sketchbook, and we'll be looking at at his artwork here a little bit closer there are notes here about where he wants the story to go and just character studies and then some original artwork there and some of his painted stuff and here is a self-portrait of the legend himself who passed away on december 2nd so this is a bio on all the stuff he worked on and how long he had been around and what he did before he became a comic book creator so I wanted to come back to these particular pages and we'll look at a couple of others and I'm just wondering what some of you that have never seen his artwork are thinking uh, because this is this book is really going to introduce a whole new audience to the man's work. I mean, this is an Eisner Hall of Fame winner and he has been working or he had worked in the comics field for over four decades before he passed away in 2020. So, my gosh, there were some iconic images. I didn't mention this. I forgot about this. Uh, but he did a lot of work in Creepy and Eerie Magazine. And there are some iconic, horrible images that are still embedded in my head from those issues. There was actually a release by Dark Horse that had just his artwork in one hardcover. But this feels more like fantasy elements. This feels like a mix between like Frank Brazetta and Boris Vallejo uh, to kind of name a few of those fantasy artists of course and of course you can't stop but think of conan but it reads nothing like conan at all this isn't your stereotypical big bulky guy going and rescuing the damsel in distress my gosh his art though 
So keep in mind, this is when he was about 75, 76 years old, and he was making artwork like this. So, yes, he did use some kind of early computer and mirror distortion. And you can definitely tell that he was using different layers, on, especially those eyes. But he also used a lot of airbrush. And I think, I, I don't know exactly how he did this because I'm still, you look at some of his older artwork and it still looks like this. It looks like he has always been drawing like this. I mean, you go and look at his stuff in the 70s, even his black and white stuff, which we'll look at here in a little bit. And you have, you, you ask yourself, how in the hell did he do this before computers? Because I, I'm as lost as anybody else. I, th I know that he used airbrushes and I know that he used uh, grayscales on the art. And then he used some kind of transparent sheet to kind of paint over. I, I don't know how he got to some of this texture, though. Or the veins right here and the muscles. And my gosh, that is just beautiful. And this is just one frame. This isn't a fully splash page. It's absolutely stunning. Um, You know, I'm a sucker for no color in comic books. I, I, some of my favorite stories are done in black and white and his use of shadows are just handled so masterfully. Like he's not even using very dark and bold black inks. Instead, he's just letting you focus on the shading on the black and white from his pencils. That's really cool to see that. Like it, it's like almost like looking at unfinished artwork. Yes, there are inks there, but not as heavy as somebody like Mike Mignola, who, of course, worshipped the ground that Richard Corbin walked on. So, and, and please, by all means, don't let me talk about, like, the dream sequence type of story. It feels like something like the In Cow. It feels like a Mobius type of story. Or any of those Johto stories that uh, have come and been translated over from humanoids. It really does feel like a European comic. I think he was the first American that was featured in Heavy Metal Magazine, if I'm not mistaken, or one of the, maybe it was the Turnlet Magazine overseas. And that might have been because of his style of storytelling. So yes, there are plenty of monsters, zombies in this book. There are some grotesque creatures. And just look at that. The texture on the stones right there. And the rubble, and of course the skull, and she's just sitting up there with the sun in the background, and then the smoke rising. Oh man, that is so freaking cool. And again, a lot of this stuff is just airbrushed. So I can't wait to see what his other work looks like. I know that Jose Villarubia is doing the colors on some of the stuff from Den, and it's coming out in hardcover. I know he's shown off some of that artwork. I'd love to have him on the show to actually... Um, Talk to him about the process of doing that and, you know, how careful you have to be because, you know, Richard Corbin passed away and now he's dealing with the colors and getting it approved, of course, by his widow and the estate. So I think it's really cool. And, man, I'm just glad to have this stuff in hardcover format. It's been long out of print. And like I said, this stuff I don't think has been collected, at least here in America. But in here you have the black and white murky world that appeared in the Dark Horse Comics Presents. And you have the color murky world for the first time in one book, one beautiful hardcover edition. This book has 168 pages and again retails for $39.99. Let's look at the binding. So it is sewn binding and there's what the eye looks like and I mentioned it having a flat spine. It lays over really nice. It is printed in this thick gloss, and I mean really thick glossy paper. Think of those library editions that Dark Horse puts out. That's the type of paper stock they are using here. But that, as they say, is that. If you're interested in purchasing this book when it comes out, don't forget to check out our sponsor, CheapGraphicNovels.com, your online home for graphic novels and collected editions up to 50% off cover price. They have excellent shipping and prompt and helpful service. Check out their bargain deals for up to 90% off cover price. And don't forget that CGN also takes pre-orders. That way you don't miss out on the hottest releases. And they are currently running a special promotion for you Minties. If you're a first-time customer, after receiving your order confirmation email, reply back to that email and let them know Near Mint Condition sent you their way. They will then apply a free shipping promotional credit to your next order in the US. Cheap Graphic Novels, your source for the hottest books with the kind of deep discount, quality shipping, and customer service that will keep you coming back for more. And that was the content, the page count, and build of this hardcover. Let me know in the comments 
comments down below. If you're a fan of Richard Corbin, if you've never heard of him, and of course, if you're interested in picking up this book and other Richard Corbin hardcovers coming out later this year from Dark Horse. Let me know in the comments down below if you have any questions. Smash that like button on the way out. Check out our Patreon and Spreadshop. Amazing ways to support the channel if you can do so. And more importantly, all of you, stay healthy and safe out there. Much love.